I would like you to take the word of God, please, and turn with me to the New Testament book of 1 Thessalonians. And we'll begin in just a moment in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13. I'm giving this brief series on the return of Christ, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're dealing with specific parts of that, if I could say parts. And I hope to give some clarity and simplicity in all of this. I remember my first occasion of hearing about the Lord's return. I had heard some things about that as a Christian, but I went into a meeting in the upstairs rooms of the courthouse where a church plant, a a group of people who were planning a church had gotten permission to have meetings. I went there with a friend and a gentleman was teaching and preaching, serving as a, a church planter, trying to get that off the ground. And he was giving a series on the second coming of Christ. I'd never seen anything like it in my life. He took the board out and a chalk on a regular chalk board and illustrated and drew pictures about the Lord's return and what would happen when Jesus Christ came again. When I uh, finished listening, he stopped preaching and I left the meeting. I thought this is the most amazing thing I've ever, I've ever seen in my life. I had no idea that all of this was gonna happen. All I thought was, Somehow or another, the world's going to come to an end and we'd see God. I didn't know that God had a specific plan for end time things. Later, when God called me into the ministry, I started a study, of course, of the return of the Lord. (laughs) And I was preaching in the second church in which I pastored and a lady came to me after the meeting and she said, Pastor, did you know that you are a, a premillennialist? And I said to her, well, what is that? And she explained it to me. And I said, well, that's what I believe the Bible teaches. And she said, well, I'd just like for you to know that I'm one too. Some people might have thought that was a disease of some kind. But then she said, you and I are the only two people who believe this in this entire church. And I'm sure you're going to have some things with which to deal because of your message. The second coming of Christ does shake things up. And there are many people who go so far as to speculate on what's going to happen I've never felt at ease doing anything like that. I'm not interested in the spectacular. I'm interested in what what is true and just staying with the simplicity that God gives us in his word. And so let's look at this passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter four, begin with verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, I want you to mark this expression in the 17th verse. Caught up together. Caught up together. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. God help us. The next time I see my mother, it'll be in the clouds. The next time I see my father, it'll be in the clouds. The next time I see my dear stepfather who married my mother after the death of my father, 
who was so very good and kind and helpful to our family, because he trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior, I'll see him in the clouds. The most certain thing in the life of every Christian is the fact that we shall see Jesus. No doubt about it. Our future is certain. It's certain. Now, I'm going to deal with just this one part of the next great family reunion. The next great family reunion. How many of you have ever been to a family reunion? Would you raise your hand? We've planned a couple of them in the summertime for you to invite your family on the Lord's Day on two different occasions. If you can't get them all to come, if Uncle Rooster or Brewster or Aunt whoever can't come on that day, then we have a second one and we want you to get the people to come. All of us have some relatives who really need to come to the reunion, no doubt about it. As I've said in the past to some of you, we had an uncle and I've been a little, a little hesitant about giving his name but he didn't have a home of his own, but he came to every relative's home for a period of time until he ate them out of house and home, and then he went to the next. And I can remember my mother saying to me on more than one occasion, uncle, and she called his name, he's coming, he's coming. And she literally would hide some things that only the children could eat. And so when he'd gone through everything, we still had a little something left when he left the place. But there's coming a glad reunion. It's not the kind of family reunion that you might have with all of the folks who are undesirable, who show up or hoard in on your reunion. Uh, this is a reunion of God's children, of God's family. And it's coming. No doubt about it, it's coming. I want you to hold your place there. Turn with me, please, back to the book of Ephesians just for a moment. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 3, beginning with verse 13, Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulation for you, which is your glory. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. I want you to mark that expression, the whole family. This is the family reunion I'm talking about. The next great family reunion. We've never gotten together like this. But all, all of God's family getting together. The whole family, the Bible says, the whole family in heaven and in earth. Now Paul spent less than a month, the record of this is given to us in the 17th chapter of Acts, in the city of Thessalonica. And a church was established there. And now he writes these epistles, 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians to encourage these Christians in Thessalonica. And these two New Testament books are filled with the truth of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Our Lord's disciples knew that Christ Jesus was born of a virgin. They knew he lived a sinless life. They knew he died on the cross and tasting death for every man. They knew that he was buried in a borrowed tomb. They knew that he arose bodily from the grave. They saw him. They spent 40 days with the resurrected Christ who came forth from the grave alive evermore bodily. They knew he was coming again because they stood with him on the Mount of Olives and saw him ascend to heaven. Let's go to that scene just for a moment, would you? Acts chapter one, if you have your Bible open there, Jesus took them out to that particular place with which they were familiar. And he said to them in verse 8 of chapter 1 of Acts, well, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken from you, shall so come into heaven, shall so come in like manner 
as you've seen him go into heaven. They knew he was coming again. You and I, you and I can say when we talk about the Lord Jesus that we believe in his virgin birth, his sinless life. We can say that we believe in his vicarious death. He died for us on the cross. We can say we believe in his bodily resurrection. We can say that we believe in his ascension to heaven. We can say that we believe that he sent the Holy Spirit to indwell believers forever. We can say that we've been given the responsibility to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's the message that they preached. And we can say to everyone, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. Now we're talking about what is commonly called the rapture. That word is not in the Bible. Because it's not in the Bible, some people are troubled with that word. But it means to be snatched out or taken up or caught up together, raptured, the glorious coming of our Lord for his own, to come up to be with him in the clouds. We believe the Bible teaches in the position I take and not everyone takes this position concerning things to come, that Christ is coming for his bride. He's coming for his own. He's coming for his church. But the world doesn't stop when he comes. Saved or caught up to be with him. And the tribulation begins on this earth. The last three and a half years of that seven years of tribulation, the worst, the great tribulation. Then at the end of that, with the battles of Armageddon, the Lord Jesus is coming again in glory and power, this time to touch upon the earth, put his feet upon this earth, to defeat evil, to set up his kingdom, to rule and reign. And there are events that take place during that prophetic period that we shall find clearly given to us in the Bible as we move along in this study. But we're dealing just with the return of the Lord for his own. Typically, when someone says to me, tell us about Jesus coming again, I will say to them, well, let's talk about his promise. And then let's talk about the plan, what happens when he comes again. Then let's talk about the preparation. It gives me a little three-point outline with which to deal with that subject and to help people grasp that, that he's promised he's coming, there's a certain plan for his coming, and we must be prepared for his coming. But let's make it even more simple. Would you write this down? We're talking about this reunion, seeing our loved ones. I want you to note, number one, Jesus is coming again. He's coming again. His work isn't finished. He's coming again. John chapter 14, if you'd like to turn there, our Lord was dealing with his brokenhearted disciples and he said, begin with verse one, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. Notice he says, I will come again. I will come again. This was a living hope in the heart of every true believer. The followers of Christ knew he was returning. And when we talk about his coming again for his own, we use the word, the imminent return of Christ. I want you to try to remember that, the imminent return of Christ. He's coming, he's coming without signs. He's coming without warning. He's coming, he's coming again. He's coming again. Nothing has to happen for that to happen. He's coming again. We're living, we're living knowing at any moment, at any moment, Christ is coming again. Let's go back to that text we started with in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. If you'll return there with me, please, for just a moment. The Bible says, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. They, we understand, were dealing with the thoughts 
with confusion concerning Christ's return and the death of loved ones before he came and would they who had died before he returned see him? And so there's clarity given in this passage. I would not have to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, meaning those who have died before the Lord's return, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. And you and I need to keep this in mind that we are not to sorrow as others. We sorrow, but not as others which have no hope. I have, through these many years, conducted many funerals and stood by many bedsides and seen many people leave this world. And I can tell you there's a difference between the dying of the saved and the dying of the unsaved. But there's also a difference between the families of those who know their loved ones are dying in the Lord, with the Lord. They're going to be with the Lord. And those who have no assurance that their loved ones are going to be with the Lord. May God help us. We are sorrowing, but not as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and that's a good place to pause and answer, do we believe that Jesus died and rose again? Yes. Certainly we do. He came out of the grave bodily. The greatest, the greatest exclamation point to all Christ has claimed is his bodily resurrection. What he says is true. He's coming again. The verification for everything he said is the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. The powerful truth that he lived and he died and he rose from the dead. So, if you believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now notice, they're sleeping in Jesus. There's no such thing as soul sleep. Their soul and spirit is with the Lord. Their body, somewhere in the ground. When we come to a burial service, we're burying a body, not the person who, in, who was living in that body, who dwelt that body. The resemblance, of course, is in that body, but the real person lived in that tabernacle of clay. And so, when the body goes to the earth, back to the dust, from which it was taken, the soul and spirit is set free to go be with God. And the Bible says they're coming with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent the word precede. You may want to write that. The word means precede or go before. You may want to write that in the margin of your authorized version of the Bible. We shall not go before or precede. We shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Think of that. They're rising first. Maybe there's some complicated reason for that. Maybe, maybe there's something that is so mysterious about that that we don't understand, quite understand that. Or maybe... It's just as simple as this. Their bodies are six feet deeper in the earth than we are. And so they're going to come up six feet lower till they get to the top of the ground where we're standing. And the Bible says, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now that means that the dead in Christ are going to have a resurrection. We're going to have a transformation. Charles Spurgeon said, <laughs> I've never read this, anyone else saying this, uh, but Charles Spurgeon said that he wanted to go through the experience of death. So he would know the power of the experience of bodily resurrection. As I said, I've never heard anyone else say that, but the man suffered greatly. Never had a well day from the day he was 43 years old to the day he died at age 57. He was always filled with pain and suffering. I, I think whatever God allows in our lives, he'll give us the grace to go through. But let's imagine right now the Lord came. He would come in the clouds. Those who have died in Christ would be caught up to be with him. 
we'd be changed in a moment, the twinkling of an eye. We would be fitted to live with God in heaven. And we'd be caught up together with those who have died in the Lord and we'll meet our loved ones and our Savior in the clouds when he comes. Caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And God says now comfort one another with these words. Comfort these words. Number two, Jesus is coming again. Number two, he's coming personally. Personally. He said in John chapter 14, I will receive you unto myself. That's not the new birth. That's not the coming of the Holy Spirit into the world. That's the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's coming personally. The angel said, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you, this same Jesus, this same one, not someone else coming for him, this same Jesus, he's coming again. He's coming personally, personally. Look, if you would, please, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and the closing verse of chapter 3. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. He's coming, he's coming personally. The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Think of this. Third thing, he's coming suddenly. Suddenly. We have never experienced anything in life that will be as sudden as the coming of Christ. The Bible says in a moment, the twinkling of an eye. The twinkle of an eye is quicker than batting an eye. Just try to close your eyelids just one time. It's quicker than that. He's coming suddenly. If I started a word, a two-syllable word, I probably wouldn't even get one syllable out until he returned before the second syllable was pronounced. It's all going to happen that quickly, that suddenly. Do you realize what we're gambling with when someone is unsaved and goes on in some sort of stubborn pride, refusing to humble himself or herself before God and seek God's forgiveness and cleansing and seek salvation in the Lord and, and the Lord alone? Quickly, suddenly, he's coming again. Walking down a hallway in a school the saved will be gone. The lost will be left. Someone told me about a large company not far from here that's going to have a layoff and a certain percentage of the employees will be there one day and not be there the next day. You know, the day is coming when Christ returns. Every saved person will be gone. Every saved person, in a moment, the twinkle of an eye, every saved person. I'm not trying to frighten you. I really am not trying to frighten you. But if Christ returned during this meeting, those who truly do not know him as Savior be left sitting in these seats and every other human being that knows Christ would be gone. If your parents are saved, you go to their home, they're gone. If your children are saved and you're not saved, you'll go and your children will be gone. Suddenly. Can you imagine what will happen worldwide when the restraining work of the Holy Spirit is removed? When the Antichrist reveals himself in the bedlam and confusion of a disrupted world, someone steps on the stage of human history with the answer. Imagine it with the answer. And the world flocks after them. The world now prepared for someone to give them answers. 
that no one else can provide. And the counterfeit Christ, the Antichrist, is made known after Christ takes his own out of this world. Peace, promises of peace, everything right. It all appears to be wonderful. Heaven's coming to earth, but heaven isn't going to come to earth. Pardon the expression, everything hellish was about to break loose during that tribulation period. I want to read something to you. I want you to listen carefully. I want to just read through the fifth chapter of this book of 1 Thessalonians. When I get to the end of it, you're going to see why. The Bible says, but the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. But when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. As travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You're not, you're not, you are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit. Despise not prophesying. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Read it. We're all to read it. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. What does it mean to you that he's coming again? The most dynamic thing in the Christian life is to be the truth of the second coming of Jesus Christ. The most life-changing thing as a Christian should be the truth of the second coming of Jesus Christ. The quality of our Christian life, the ability to get on with life and over hurt is in the truth of the second coming of Jesus Christ. The comfort that we have in the deepest hour of need is in the truth of the second coming of Jesus Christ. The most purifying thing in the Christian life is the truth 
of the second coming of Jesus Christ. First John chapter three, John, who was with him and loved him, devoted his life to Christ, writes, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, but we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him. How many of you have that hope in you? Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Nothing, nothing is dynamic as the return of our Lord. If we view his return as we should view it. Let's bow in prayer, may we? There are people who hear messages like this who have serious doubts about their salvation. There are people who understand when they hear messages like this that they've never really been born again. And there are people who hear messages like this who know that they're saved, they know they're saved, but this life-changing dynamic effect of the return of the Lord is not a part of their lives. Why? Why? It's because we've become so entangled with this world so entangled with this world that we've lost our vision of the return of Christ. Oh, may God help us. May God help us. He's coming again. He's coming again. This very same Jesus rejected of men with power and great glory. He's coming again. You realize you're in bondage without him? Out of my bondage, sorrow, night, Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come. Will you come to him? I want us to stand quietly with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Let the Holy Spirit do his work in your heart and respond accordingly.